Okay. Well, thanks for uh, having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about sublinear algorithms, um, and the title is a, sort of a takeoff on a movie that I think came out in the 90s about um, called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. But about it had Rod Brooks and an elephant trainer and a topiary gardener, and basically four people that were a bit crazy. And they, and I like the title, and it seemed sort of apt for today's talk. Okay, so. What I'm interested in is algorithms that are good for really big data. It's so big, the data, that it doesn't actually fit into your computer. Um, and in fact, part one, I'm going to talk about the case where you just don't have time to even view all the data. Okay, so what can you hope to do in such a setting? Um, let me, just to make this concrete, let's start with an example that um, in this country a lot of people have heard of, but in countries such as Israel, uh, They've never heard of this phenomenon. So this is the small world phenomenon. And they say, OK, let's take the social network. This is a graph. Each node is a person. And if I know you, like if I know Mike, then we have an edge between us. And if I know Dick, I have another edge between us. Now the question is, are all pairs of people connected by a path of distance at most six? OK, so this was the famous Milgram experiment that claimed to show that this is true. When I give this talk in Israel, they're like, what do you mean six? Because it's two, or 1.3, or something like that. And they don't know what I'm even talking about. They never heard of it, because it doesn't even register there. OK, so, um, but here it holds. And you know, there was a play about this, and a, a lot of press. OK, so the question is, is it really true? I mean, people say this Milgram experiment didn't really prove anything. Um, so is it really true that everybody's connected by a path of distance at most six? And the question is, how would you test this? Are you going to go around asking everybody in this room, who do you know? Like, start listing everybody you've ever met. And then they go do this to every single person in the whole country. And then check if they really are, um, if there's really a path of a most six between every pair. I mean, this is sort of a crazy amount of data. By the time you do this, somebody might die, and that might change the situation. Um, if you asked this question over the whole world, you might never know because there might be like some little island that has somebody there that was born on the island because his parents like washed up there. And, uh, and then they never met anybody and isn't connected at all to the universe. Okay, so these things happen. I mean, they do find kind of tribes of people that were sort of disconnected from the rest of uh, the world um, in various like kind of remote locations and um, and so this sometimes happens. You can maybe assume that it can't be too many people. Otherwise, they'd be generating so much energy that we would have seen, noticed something about them. But, so you can maybe assume something about the number of such crazy situations. Uh, you can maybe assume something about the speed at which things change. But in general, how would we even test such a thing? All right. So in general, what's the problem with vast data? It's impossible to access. It's, um, even if it's um, potentially all of the of the data that you could potentially access, you just don't have time to access all of it. Um, and finally, once you access it, the data can change. So we had this gold standard. Eddie talked about polynomial time algorithms. That was our goal. Even better, linear time algorithms. That's another goal. That's a harder goal. Okay, but even this might be inadequate. Okay, so. What can you hope to do in this case? OK, so this is, this is the gold star that you get when you take undergraduate algorithms and you find the linear time algorithm. That gives you an A plus in the class. The question is, is that good enough for us? OK, so what can you hope to do? Well, we're going to have to modify our goals. We're not going to be able to answer kind of for all or exactly type questions. For example, we are not going to be able to say exactly how many people on this earth are left-handed. And in fact, why would we even care? Because of the birth-death situation, the data is changing. We don't really care how exactly. What we'll have to do is approximate. We won't actually be able to answer whether all individuals in this world are connected by six degrees of separation. The compromise we'll have to make is to ask, Approximately, how many individuals on Earth are left-handed? And you know, this is, you know, this is why, this is the only data you'd ever see anyway. When if you read the newspaper and they give you a data on how many people are left-handed, they never tell you, you know, an exact number. They give you an approximate number, right? So similarly, what we'll hope to be able to say is, is there a large group, say 99% of the of the country, is connected by at most six degrees of separation? Okay, so that's the type of compromise we're going to have to make. 
Um, and I want to talk about two types of compromises or approximations. One is property testing, which I'll define in a moment, and I'll start with that. And the other is the traditional notions of approximation, where you're trying to approximate a number, or you're trying to come up with a solution that is you know, good, um, is, you know, it's at least 99% as good as the optimal solution, okay? or it's within a factor of two of the optimal solution, something like that. So that's traditional approximation. But let me start with the weirder one first. Um, and these are tests of data. You want to know, does it have a certain type of property? Okay, so in this graph of, you know, I know Lenore, Lenore knows Manuel, Manuel knows Dick. In that graph of who knows who, what is the, what is the, are we, do we have the six degrees of separation property or not? Okay, so there's, it's like a bit. We want to know yes or no. Okay, um, so we want to distinguish inputs that have the specific property from those, not those that don't have the property, but those that are far from having the property. So I like to think of these as in the ballpark tests. Uh, so I know you like baseball. <laughs> so it's a, you're either in the ballpark or you're out of the ballpark. But kind of if you're on the, on the border here, like hanging off the lights, uh, then a, a, you know why I say hanging off the lights. Because there was that guy in the earthquake in 1989 that swung from the lights. <laughs> but he, st he stayed alive. Okay, but is, are they in the ballpark or not in the ballpark if they're just swinging during an earthquake, kind of sometimes in, sometimes out? We don't care. Okay, that's not. In this case, we can say, yes, it has the property. It's in the ballpark. You can also say, no, it doesn't have the property because it's not quite in the ballpark. I don't really care. Okay? But if you're in the ballpark, I want you to say yes. If you're far from being in the ballpark, I want you to say no. On the border, I don't care. Okay. Why do we, and that's the approximation that I say I don't care. If I'm on the edge here, I can, I tell you, you don't, I don't care what you say. You can say whatever you want. Okay? And the fact that I give you that leeway on the border to say whatever you want means I can often answer such questions much faster. Um, anyway, it might be the natural question to ask when there's some kind of noise or when the data is changing. Um, and definitely it gives you a fast sanity check for ruling out very bad inputs. Okay? So that's another point. Also, it's related to, um, for those of people that are interested in machine learning in this audience, it, it's um, essentially related to the model selection problem in machine learning. OK, so that's another reason why you might be interested in this type of question. So what's the requirement of our property tester? If the input has the property, we're supposed to pass. Um, if the input is far from having the property, and I will define what I mean by far in a minute, then we need to fail. OK, now we have randomized algorithms. They're going to be sampling. Sometimes they're just going to be wrong, OK, just because they made stupid choices. Like, they, they make choices randomly on where to look. And sometimes you're just unlucky. You know, and it looks like the thing has the property because you never looked at the place where it doesn't have the property. And you were just unlucky with how you tossed your coins. Um, so you might make a mistake and think the input has the property when it doesn't. You might also think it's far from having the property uh, when it actually does have the property for some reason. Okay? So, um, so we're going to just say you have to give the right answer with high probability. You know, if it has the property, Right. If it has the property, then with very high probability, you should say pass. If it's far from having the property with high probability, you should say fail. In the in-between cases, I don't care. You can sometimes say pass, sometimes say fail. You can always say pass. I don't care what you do. OK, so I need to specify two things here. What is epsilon far? What does it mean far from having the property? So this really depends on your setting. Like It depends on your situation and what you care about. I'm going to give some examples today. So today, when I talk about far, I mean um, that the input has to be changed in, say, epsilon fraction of the locations in order to make it have the property. So it's something we'll call the Hamming distance. It's the, num it's the fraction of locations I've got to change the input in to make it have the property. OK, and I'll give an example in a minute. OK, so here, oh, here's the example. OK, so here's an example. Um, I want to test if a list is sorted. Is it alphabetized? You know, is my, al is my phone book alphabetized? Here's a list of names, Y1 through YN. And I want to know, is this list sorted? Well, to determine that precisely the old way, I'd have to go through the whole list and look at every YI and check that YI plus 1 is bigger than YI. And I can do that in linear time. You know, I can just go read every one. Yeah, that's bigger than that. That's bigger than that. And go on. And that's fine. OK, but if I want to do something in sublinear time, can I, um, I can't distinguish the case where 
all of them are sorted from the case that even one isn't sorted, because there might be just one thing that's wrong, like that's out of place. And if I don't see it in my random sample, then I won't know about it, OK? So what we're trying to say is um, our goal is to quickly test if the list is close to sorted, OK? So what I want to talk about what do I mean by quickly, and what do I mean by close to? So quickly, I mean the query complexity is measured in terms of the list size n. So this, I've got n numbers, and I'm going to talk about how many numbers I need to look at in this list in order to decide if it's close to sorted. And our goal is to get something sublinear in n. And we're actually going to go for something that looks like logarithmic in n. Okay, So it'll be fairly easy to see some square root n type thing, but we're going to go for logarithmic. Second, um, what do I mean by close? What do I mean by the list being close to sorted? I mean that a list of size n is epsilon close to being sorted if I can delete at most epsilon fraction of the elements to make it sorted. So, so here's some examples. So epsilon is given to me as an input. Somebody tells me, I want to test if this thing is sorted or at most or at least like 1 over 10 far from sorted. Okay. So here's a list that's sorted. Here's a list that's close to sorted. If I kind of deleted these three elements, this thing would be sorted, right? And there, that's seen. I deleted them. Now that's a sorted list. And this thing is kind of far from sorted because of these three, 45, 39, 23, I can only keep at most one. And then it's followed by the one, so I have to figure out I either keep the one or I keep one of those. So let's get rid of all three of those. Uh, and you know what, you go through this thing, and you, every time you have a decreasing sequence, you can only keep at most one of those sequence, and maybe not even. So in the end, this is the closest, uh, this is the closest sorted sequence that I managed to find from this example. Okay? I had to delete half the list to get here to a sorted list. Okay? So this, this is a sequence that's far from sorted. This is a sequence that's close to sorted, and this is, of course, sorted. All right, so what we want from the algorithm is it should pass sorted lists, fail lists that are epsilon far. And I'm going to use the contrapositive here. You know, if p implies q, that's equivalent to saying not q implies not p. That's how we always do our proofs here. OK, so I'm going to prove not q implies not p. In other words, I'm going to say if it's, wait, I want to say, OK, what we said before was if the list is sorted, you should pass. And if the list is epsilon far from sorted, you should fail. Instead, what we're going to prove is if you're likely to pass, in other words, not fail, OK? If you're likely to pass, then it must be that you're close to sorted. OK, so not <coughs> just making clear, because um, this always confuses everybody when I teach this. So I want a sorted implies uh, pass. And I want epsilon far implies fail. And of course, this is with high probability. So I want not this, meaning I'm likely to pass, implies not this, that I'm epsilon close. Yeah? Please define again epsilon far. Epsilon far, oh, OK. So epsilon far means I need to delete at least epsilon fraction of the elements to get it to be sorted. OK? So I could epsilon fraction, but I know how the list is of length n. So I need to delete at least epsilon times n many elements. OK? Any other questions? Can we think that epsilon is small or big? Does it matter? You can think of it as um, I'm going to give you a running time in terms of epsilon. It's going to be 1 over epsilon times log n. Uh, so you can think of it however you want, and then you can decide if this algorithm is useful for you based on what you decided epsilon is. Okay. So, but you could say that epsilon, if, it's, you know, if you really need to know if the list is 1 over a million close to sorted and your list is only size 100,000, then you might as well just look at everything. So <laughs> I guess that, that's sort of the trade-off. <laughs> okay. I want to mention, we're going to ask for a certain probability of success that's a const, at least a constant bigger than a half. That's standard. And we're going to use the standard tools in our f field of just, you know, if I get it right with probability at least 3 quarters, I, um, and you want it right with probability um, delta, 
like you want probability of error at most delta. You want it always to, you know, maybe you want 1 minus 1 in the number of atoms in the universe. I can repeat this test log 1 over delta times and get you error probability at most delta. Okay, so it's totally standard. So I'm always going to look for, I'm going to ignore delta for almost everything in this talk except for maybe one line at a certain place, place where I mention Eric Price's result, if I get there. Okay, so, uh, but for the most part, I'm just going for constant probabilities because of that. Okay. So now, remember, if the list is not sorted but not far, I don't really care. You know, it's OK for me to say that it's sorted um, because it's not epsilon far. It's also OK for me to say that it's not sorted because it's not actually sorted. So that's true, that it's not sorted. It's not sorted. So, so it's sort of, you know, in some sense, either way science progressed. Like I either know that I'm close to being sorted or I know, I know that I found a place where it's not sorted. So, um, either way, I got some kind of information out of that, but I don't have to decide which type of information I get. Um, for these guys in the middle, the fact that I didn't decide on them gives me this flexibility that allows me to get much, much faster <coughs> algorithms. Okay, and it turns out this we're going to be able to test in 1 over epsilon times log n time. time. So this is, there should be parentheses around the 1 over epsilon uh, times log n time, and you can't do any better. All right, so here's a proposed algorithm. This is like a first attempt. One thing I might do is just pick a random index, look at x sub i, look at x sub i plus 1. I'm sorry, y sub i and y sub i plus 1, and make sure they're in the right order. So just look at neighbors. OK, so let's see what happens here in just a minute. OK, I pick a random neighbor here. Well, you know, it's always the case in the sorted input that yi plus 1 is bigger than yi. Here, it's. Um, you know, except for these three places, the test would pass. You know, if I asked here, 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 um, or here, or even here, the test would pass. There's only a couple of places where the test doesn't pass. Here, here, and here. So three out of all those other places where the test doesn't actually pass. So <coughs> the test will pass some of the time. Well, the test will pass most of the time. There's a few places where the test might not pass. When it's far, there's a lot of places where this test won't pass. It won't pass here, 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 or here. Uh, yeah, it will pass here. It won't pass here. I mean, there's a ton of places. Every place where yi is bigger than yi plus 1, this thing is going to fail. So <coughs> it's going to do the right thing on this. It's going to do the right thing on this. And here we said we don't care. Everything's right. All right. So that seems like a good idea, except then there's this bad input type. OK, and this bad input type takes the, it just says, OK, I'm going to take the following input. I'm going to write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n over 4. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n over 4. I do this four times. OK, if you want to look at a picture of this input, it's something like this. All right, if I pick a random i, most of the time I land in the middle of one of these sequences and everything looks good. But there's only four places where I go from n over 4 to 1 where there's actually a problem. So my probability of finding a problem here is only 4 out of n. That's very small. But this thing is extremely far from being sorted. To make this thing sorted, I have to delete at least 3 quarters of the elements. Okay, Because you see, I, I can take 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n over 4 once, but I can't have more than that. All right, so that's not good. Um, OK, so maybe this is a bad test. Right? Because here's a bad input that passes with high probability, but it's extremely far from being sorted. So that's a bad test. What would be another proposed algorithm? What would you think of? Pick two random and check them. Gosh, I, I didn't actually place them, but I knew that somebody would suggest this. <laughs> it's, it's like, so I, so I um, so you'll pick random i and j and test that yi is less than or equal to yj. Okay, so of course, if I mean, so pick random i and j. Let's say i is less than j. So I pick two random elements, maybe here and here. Oh, they're in the right order. And I pick maybe two more random elements. That's great. So the sorted thing will obviously pass. The close ones usually will pass as long as I don't hit one of these green ones. And maybe it will even pass if I hit one of these green ones. Who knows? This guy, though, maybe it'll pass. Maybe it won't. I don't know what happens. So let's look. Uh, OK, so here's a bad input type, which is 
n over four groups of four decreasing elements. Okay, so I'm going to look at four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. Then the next group is bigger than any of these guys, but it's also in decreasing order. Okay, then the next group is bigger than anything preceding it, but it's also in decreasing order, the next four. Okay, what is the biggest monotone subsequence of this thing? What is it like? How many uh, nodes do I, uh, how many of these numbers do I have to delete to get a monotone a sequence? I can only keep one of each group of four. So I still have to get rid of three quarters of the points, even in this example. Okay? But now to pick i and j and see that yi is in the wrong order from yj, I would have to pick two nodes from the same group. Okay? So we have n over 4 groups, and I've got to hit the same group twice. That is a birthday paradox calculation. And that we know is square root n. I need to take square root n different samples to find this birthday paradox <coughs> problem. Okay? So that's why I'm going to need, for this test, I need root n samples. So that's good. It's sublinear, but it's not good enough for us because we were going to go for log n, right? Okay. Well, so we said looking at neighbors isn't good. Looking at two random elements, that's good, but not great, OK? So let me just point out something. In the first case, we were looking at things very close together. In the other case, when you pick two random neighbors, those guys are usually like very far apart, right? That's the problem, usually, when you pick two random numbers, is they're usually very far apart. What if you tried to look at every possible distance, 2 to the i? You know, things that are about 1 apart, 2 apart, 4 apart, 8 apart, 16 apart. You know, all the different distances. So there's only log n sort of buckets of distances you'd have to look at. Maybe that's the right thing to do. And that's essentially what we're going to do. But we're going to use our good old friend binary search to do this. OK? So let's, um, let me just assume that the list is distinct, because this is something Dick Karp taught me to, that you can assume in the 1980s. Uh, so it's an old trick uh, from, that you taught me in the context of uh, parallel computing. Um, but why can I assume the list is distinct? Because I want to claim this is not really an easier problem. The fact that I could have had repetitions of numbers doesn't really make things easier, because I could have virtually appended the index um, i to each x sub i. So instead of looking at a list x1 through xn, I could think of it virtually, but in my head, as x1, comma 1, x2, comma 2, because I, I know when I look at it what the index is that got me there. So I could just think of it that way. And this sort of breaks ties without without changing the order. So if I had like one that would go to one one, this one would go to one two, this two would go to two three, because it's got and this six goes to six four and the other six goes to six five. Okay, so it doesn't change the so if you think of these now as <coughs> slightly bigger numbers, um, I don't have any duplicates because everybody has a distinct second digit, but also Look that um, one should still, if you, the higher order digit, I should still be in order according to the highest order digit. So this won't break the ties. Yeah. And you're paying a log space penalty? So yeah, but anyway, I was paying a log space. OK, good point. OK, that's actually a very good point. Uh, I am paying a log space penalty. So I'm kind of assuming right now that this is without loss of generality if these n numbers were log n bit numbers. OK, and actually, the lower bounds that I, that's a really good question, because the lower bounds I said that you need log n time, they really don't hold if you were like trying to check if a, a bunch of bits were sorted, like zeros and ones, or zeros, ones, and two. If you had like a constant size set of numbers, sorry, numbers like in the range that's zero to some constant, then you can do much, you can do even better than what I'm suggesting here. So that is a very on point question. Um, but I am assuming here that it's, without loss of generality, only when this case is true. All right, so w let's assume everybody's distinct. And here's the test. We're going to do the following thing, 1 over epsilon many times. We're going to pick a random i. We're going to look at the value of y sub i. It's just a number. You know, look at the ith location. It's a number. You see a number like 1,001, OK? Now, forget where you found it. You, don't, you know, it's the number 1,001. That's what you keep in your head. Now do binary search on this list that's supposed to be sorted for 1,001. You better end up where you started. Like, assuming that this list really was distinct, you're supposed to end up where you started, right? Yes? If it was sorted. OK, so 
So if somehow you didn't end up at the right place, or if you had an inconsistency in the binary search, like you went left and the numbers got bigger, or you went right and the numbers got smaller, that's not good, then you fail this list. You say, this list is not in sorted order. Um, but, and if you don't end up at location I, you fail this list because there must have been some problem here. Um, and if you did this thing one over epsilon many times, you pa and you never failed it, then you can pass. Okay, so this running time is 1 over epsilon log n. Let's <coughs> see what it would have done in our example back here. Okay, here I pick a random location. Okay, so pick a random location. I end up at 23. I do binary search. I'm going to end up at this location if I do binary search for 23 because that's the nice thing about binary search on a sorted list. Here, that might happen if I like picked the number 5 Let's say I um, land, first I look at 14. I say 5 is less than 14, so I will go left. Um, in fact, that might be the next thing I look at. So I see 5 where I'm supposed to see 5. Great. OK? Um, it might not work for me when I go for 2. It, so the list, so I'll have a problem in my binary search when I look for 2, because I'll start here at 14. I'll say go left. I'll look at 5. I'll go left. And then I might look at 4. And I'll go left, and I'll see 1, and there's nothing else there. So I n I'll never find the 2. So it would fail. OK, but a lot of the numbers that I look for here, if I pick at random, a lot of these numbers, I'd actually find them. Some I might not. OK, what happens here? Well, here, I'm going to get really messed up. For example, let's see, who should we look for? Let's say I look for 20. Um, so I first look at 5. OK, I know 20 is bigger, so I should go here. I look at 2, I already see a problem. OK, because 2 is smaller than 5. I wasn't supposed to get smaller when I went to the right. So I had a problem in the binary search. OK? Um, yeah, and I think that's the right way to do it. So, so anything that looked at 2, would, all these guys would see a problem because they look at 2 next. And they would um, say, I wasn't supposed to get smaller when I went right. Yeah? So if the list is truly sorted, of course, your test will pass. But if I just have to delete one element, you can fill it on every single Okay, almost every single one. Right, but that's where the point is that, that when, it, when the thing is close to sorted, but not sorted, I'm allowed to answer fail if I want. So it, it's kind of, this is the beauty of this definition that it's not actually sorted, so I'm allowed to fail it, but I don't have to if I don't find the problem. Uh, so that's kind of the leeway there. But I want to prove to you, actually, uh, that this algorithm actually works not just on my examples, but in general. OK, so let's just say index i is good. So this is just a one slide proof. If you don't like it, I move on to the next slide in a minute. OK, so um, I want to say that index i is good if when I did the binary search for y sub i, it was actually successful. So y sub i is the item that was located in location i. And now I look, think of that as the number. I do binary search. And if I end up in location y sub i, like if I end up in location i, I, and I never had a problem, I never went left and got bigger, I never went right and got smaller, as long as that happens, the binary search for y sub i is successful. It took me logarithmic time to do that, but that's how I can tell. OK, so what is the test restated? We are going to pick 1 over epsilon size sample of these locations i and pass if they're all good. OK, that's what our test is that we had on the previous slide says to do. OK, and that takes 1 over epsilon log n time, because for each to check if you're good, it takes logarithmic time. All right, so now what's the correctness? If the list is sorted, then all the i's are good. OK, this is, for this part, that's where we use the distinctness. The other, I mean, if you weren't distinct, then you might not actually end up at your location. You might end up at some other location, like maybe the one right before you, or maybe if there was a run of 10 things the same uh, weight, then you might have ended up at any one of them. So I don't know about that. but. If you're distinct, the test always passes. If the list is, remember we're doing now, if the list is likely to pass, not this, implies not this. I want to show if it's likely to pass, then it's epsilon close. That's equivalent to saying that if it's epsilon far, then we're going to fail. OK, so if it's likely to pass, then what's the first thing? Just because we sampled, if it's likely to pass the test, then we know that because we took a sample of size 1 over epsilon, 
there can't be more than epsilon fraction of bad i's. Okay, so we can assume that at least one minus epsilon n fraction of the i's are good. That's just sampling. I haven't done anything yet. Okay, now the main observation is if I look at all these good elements, they have to be in the right order. So one minus epsilon fraction of the elements are good. Now what I want to show you is any set of good elements must be in the right order. Okay, and why is that? It's because let's take a pair i less than j. Okay, so let's say i is good and j is good. And I did some kind of binary search, which we can think of as sort of a tree. I start in the middle, and then I, um, let's put i and j a little closer. Okay, so I start, I do some search, I look at first at the middle guy, and then I, um, and then, then the next thing I do is look in, a, in the middle of this, wait, so I start in the middle, I go here, um, and then maybe I go here, and then here, and then, uh, and follow some path to i, and follow some path to j, when I do my binary search, okay? And at some point, at the least common ancestor of i and j, so in the binary search for i, I found i. In the binary search for j, I found j. There is some path, okay? Let's look at the least common ancestor of i and j. So this is the place that we're gonna call k. That's the place we looked at where after we looked at location k, i was less than k, so we went left. j was bigger than k, so we went right. Okay, that's the least common ancestor of my search path. And it, for them to diverge, because we assumed i is less than j, it has to be there was some place where we went left for i and right for j. At that place, we know that the value of location i, y sub i, is less than e or equal to y sub k. So we have that y sub i is less than or equal to y sub k. That's because we went left. And we also know that y sub j is bigger than or equal to y sub k. That's because j went right. Okay, so we're just using basic binary search properties. That's all we're doing. And then we have, because this is smaller than k and this is bigger than k, then yi must be less than or equal to y sub j. So great, it means they're in the right order. So if I take any group of good elements, of which I have one minus epsilon fraction, they're all pairwise in the right order, and that means I have a a large monotone increasing subsequence of size one minus epsilon times n. Okay, so that's all I have to do. Okay, questions on this? Okay, and to make this list monotone, all we have to do is delete the epsilon times n fraction, um, the epsilon times n bad elements, and then we're done. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of the example. So in general, how would you construct a property tester? You have to find some characterization of the property that's somehow efficiently testable. Um, here we use some kind of binary search idea. And it's robust in the sense that the objects that have the property satisfy the characterization. And if you saw in the monotonicity test, that for us was the easy side. With the harder thing usually is to show that objects that are far from having the property are actually unlikely to pass. And that was where we did the work of defining the good elements and saying, okay, uh, you know, most of the elements are good and good things have this nice property that um, because we did this binary search thing, we know they're in the right order. Okay, so that's where we did the work. All right, so that's usually the bigger challenge. Let me give another example. You, Let's say you want to test a program. Like when I was a PhD student here, I worked with Manuel and with Sampath on testing whether programs were correct. You can't test the program on every single input. Okay, so you can think of the, you know, you can query the program <coughs> at any specific input, but you can't look at it on every single input because it way too much time. Um, so now, I want to see if this program is reasonable. Well, it's supposed to be commuted, maybe it's a program for multi matrix multiplication. It's not supposed to be commutative, but it is supposed to be associative. So maybe I could somehow test that it's associative, or maybe I could test that it satisfies the distributive property. Okay, so there's some property like that where I can't go through every single input and test does it really satisfy the distributive property, but maybe there's some way I can show that this function has the right structure, or for most inputs has the right structure. And that's the idea. So you'd like to test if a function is a homomorphism or what we call a linear function that f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y um, for all x and y. You can test that in constant time independent of the size of the domain. Okay? You can, I mean, meaning that you can separate programs that are, 
that are uh, that satisfy this homomorphism property for all x y from um, programs that are not close to any function that is a homomorphism on more than one minus epsilon fraction of the inputs. Okay, so you so it's actually not just testing that it satisfies. Um, for all x, y most of the time, but it's actually testing that you're close to a specific, to some homomorphism on one minus epsilon fraction of the inputs. Another example is you can test if a sparse social network graph has six degrees of separation, also in constant time, if you allow this notion of distance. Okay, so let me just give some example of the homomorphism property of functions. A bad testing characterization would ask you for all x, y, f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. You cannot test all x and y. Um, another bad characterization is you wouldn't want to just pick random x's and test that mostly f of x plus f of 1 is equal to f of x plus 1. I think now you have some intuition from the monotonicity testing example of how this could go terribly wrong. Okay. Um, and here's a good characterization. Uh, for most x, y, f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. So it's clear that good homomorphisms, they satisfy this for all x, y, they will pass. But what is a little bit harder to prove is that the only thing that passes this test for most x, y are actually functions that agree with some homomorphism on most inputs. <coughs> and just a warning, um, it's not just what you have to prove to show that these characterizations are robust. It's not just some like simple statistical property. In fact, it's not even true for most. Um, you know, for all versions of most, you need this most to be at least seven ninths, otherwise it completely breaks down. Okay, so you know, usually in statistics you don't just break down at seven ninths. So yeah. What's a homomorphism? This is a homomorphism. That's the definition. So a function a function that's additive? That satisfies this. I mean that's what we were testing. So the, yeah. So it's supposed to be over a group. Let's forget about that for now. But I mean, let's pretend, uh, but, but let me assume we are talking about discrete domains here for the most part, okay? So I'm talking about things over, you can, it doesn't have to be discrete domains like finite groups. It could be subsets of infinite groups. You can do that. Um, it's, a, it's much more messy, but you can do it using the same kinds of ideas. Um, but it has to be a discrete domain. So it has to be a discrete set of, the X's have to come from a discrete domain. Okay, for six degrees of separation, here's two bad testing characterizations. For every node, all other nodes should be within distance six. So you can't test that because how would you go check every other node and see if it's really within distance six? For most nodes, all other nodes are with distance six. That's also really hard to check. Anytime you have a all, it's bad news. Um, but here's a good characterization. For most nodes, there are many other nodes within distance six, and that turns out to be pretty good. Okay, for, for this definition of closeness. Okay, I want to mention that many more properties have been studied um, over graphs, functions, point sets, strings, um, and actually there's some uh, amazing characterizations of, pro of problems testable in both graphs and function testing models. So I mentioned a bunch of properties of functions, uh, linearity, low total degree polynomial, um, Monotone, convex, submodular. Again, these are over discrete domains, so it's some kind of discretization of these notions. Yeah. What's junta? Junta is um, it means that it's a function of like an n-dimensional. It's a function in an n-dimensional uh, domain, but it only depends on a small number of the locations. So a dictator function actually maybe only looks at the ith location, even though there's n minus one other locations you can look at in the input. It only looks at the ith location, and based on that makes a decision. A junta might look at k locations, and based on that make a decision. Okay, so it's really like what you would think of from the South American politics. Uh, okay, so there's lots of properties of functions that people look at. Properties of graphs, for dense graphs, it's completely characterized the, um, so it's sort of a weird thing for dense graphs. Most of the graph properties you've heard, for dense graphs, I'm thinking of you know, adjacency matrix. We say it's far if you have to change at least epsilon n squared of the edges to make it have the property. So it's like a very dense graph. Um, there, it's completely characterized what's testable. And almost all <coughs> the graph properties you can think of, like colorable, by, um, 
the small cut, large cut, not small cut, but large cut, and a, uh, all the interesting properties that the people come up with for dense graphs, different kinds of partition properties, they're all testable in constant time, except the only natural thing I know of that is not constant time testable or needs linear time to test. So kind of either it needs linear time or it's constant time testable. The only thing that's in the middle is graph isomorphism. And that has, that's the only example I know of that's natural that is not either constant time or linear time. That's for dense graphs. That's the story for them. It's amazing um, work. It's very deep mathematically. I'm not going to even try to explain that to you. Um, and it depends on, a, to show this, this Semaretti regularity lemma and all sorts of uh, beautiful uh, um, extensions of it. OK. Hyperfinite graphs is kind of the, um, don't get scared of that word. What that just means is the graph is actually a very, for example, minor free graphs are hyperfinite. Planar graphs are, are you know, for example, my, um, planar graphs. They're really non-expanding. Okay? And what it means is I can remove epsilon fraction of the edges and break and shatter the graph into small connected components. So it, there exists a way to remove a small fraction of the edges and completely shatter this graph into small pieces of size polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Not even a log factor, just constant size components that depend only on epsilon. Okay, so those are hyperfinite graphs. Planar graphs are a good example. Uh, all minor free graphs fit in that. Um, and a, so it's completely characterized what's testable in that model, and pretty much everything is testable in that model, um, in that type of graph. And general sparse graphs, which may be expanders or maybe part, expanders in one section and uh, very non-expanding in another section, there it's a little bit trickier and there's a lot of work to do, but there are some results of giving sublinear time testers for things like bipartiteness, connectivity, diameter, colorability, expansion. Rapid mixing, is the graph triangle free? Um, so there's a bunch of things, lots of nice tools. I mentioned Semaretti regularity lemma, also random walks, local search, simulated greedy, borrowing from parallel algorithms, which I'll say a bit more of about in a minute. OK, so some other combinatorial properties are for sets, strings, metric properties. Um, oh, a, is Danny still here? OK, clustering, if you want to ask He's the guy to ask about clustering, so uh, you should, uh, um, you've got the man here. OK, good. Um, so what else? OK, so this is, there's still a lot of questions of things that we don't know how to property test. Uh, it's sort of an active area, lots of people working in it, and lots of results kind of hard to even keep track of. OK, I want to move to classical approximation and talk about not how to test if your input has a property or not, but to estimate some parameter of it. Okay, so maybe um, I want to know the size of a minimum spanning tree. I want to estimate the size of the min spanning tree. Or I want to estimate the size of a vertex cover. Or I want to estimate the size of a max cut or the size of, an, um, of a large matching. You know, positive linear program, edit distance. These are all things that have been considered in this model, and there are sublinear time algorithms for them. Um, I'm going to give a a very simple example, just to see. Um, it's, de it's actually de the one example I know of of a sublinear time deterministic uh, approximation algorithm. Um, the rest are all randomized. Um, and we're going to get an approximate answer. And of course, it's sublinear time. So here, we're going to give you a matrix of distances between m points. So it's an m by m matrix. So our input size is m squared. OK? And the dij is the distance from i to j. We're going to assume that this distance matrix satisfies triangle inequality and symmetric. Okay? But notice the input size is the number of points squared. I'm going to get you something because, I, because it's kind of an arbitrary symmetric triangle inequality distance matrix. Okay? Now, let ij be the indices that <coughs> maximize dij. Okay? So these are the farthest two points in this metric space. Okay, and then if that's the case, we call dij the diameter. Okay, so these are the farthest two points. That's the diameter of our point set. Okay? All right. What we want to do is we want to output <coughs> kl so that it's two points k and l so that the distance between k and l is at least half the diameter. So this is a two approximation, two multiplicative approximation. Okay, that's the goal. And we're going to do this in time 
order m, where the input size is n, which is m squared. So it's going to be square root the input size. Okay, so here's the algorithm. Just pick an arbitrary point k. And then take the farthest point from k. So L is the thing that maximizes dKL. It's the farthest point from k. How much time did I need to do that? I just need to go down k's row and see who's the farthest point from k. So this just takes me order the number of points time, which is square root the size of the matrix, okay? All right, so that's it. That's the whole thing. And I claim that's at least half the diameter. Okay, why? Um, well, let's say i and j were the real diameter. These were the real farthest two points. Okay, well, k, d, I, okay, so the distance between i and j is um, shorter by triangle inequality than if I went from i to k and then from k to j, right? Okay, so if I had gone like this, that would be a longer way to get from i to j. But this is less than or equal to that because I chose this to be the farthest point from k. You know, I chose this to be the maximum edge adjacent to k. So I know that this is smaller than this guy. And I also know that this guy is smaller than this guy. All right, so I know that dik is less than dkl and dkj is less than dkl. And I'm using here the algorithm because it picked the farthest point from k as well as symmetry because I, I flipped. Uh, I flipped something here, this guy, dik. I used the fact that dik and dki are the same. Okay, so, uh, okay. so it's simple, right? And now I'm done. So now dij is at most D, two times dkl. Okay, so this thing, um, so dkl is at least half dij. So that's it, that's the whole thing, okay? The, does this really count as deterministic when you're picking k arbitrarily? Oh, I see your point. Okay, I could pick k to be the first point. Okay. And this would still work. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this was found, this was, uh, this is a really old example due to Indic from late 90s. Um, and it's, I think, one of the first sublinear approximation that I know of. Maybe you guys know more. Um, all right. Okay, that was kind of a specific case, you know, like I don't even know how to do that kind of thing on a graph, like how do I find the diameter of a graph or how do I find um, the diameter of points where I don't get their inputs as a metric space but actually there is some like nice function that tells me, you know, the, the input, maybe the input is just the location of the points on the grid. Then I, then I don't know how to do this thing in sublinear time, okay? So how do we develop techniques for this field that work for families of problems? So, the answer is there are techniques that work for families of problems. But before I show you that, I'm going to first show you a slightly different model. Okay. And here, we have not only large inputs, but also large outputs. Okay. So I don't have time to look at all the input. But the output of this function was supposed to be big. What do I mean by big? Uh, like maybe I want actually to compute the maximal independent set of a very large graph. But do I really have to compute the whole maximal independent set just to figure out? I just want to know, am I in it? Okay. Maybe we want to do a whole scheduling problem. We want to schedule all of us to use the tennis courts. I don't really care when Manuela gets scheduled for the tennis courts. I want to know, when do I get scheduled for the tennis courts? Do I have to compute the whole optimization problem just to figure out when my tennis time is? I don't even play tennis, so I really don't want to do that. Okay. Okay. So here we're in the setting where we have large inputs, large outputs. Like, okay, when you don't need to see all the output, do you really need to see all the input? That's the question. And there are lots of cases where you don't need to. Okay. So for example, locally decodable codes. What do they say? I have the input is a big code is a big message. Sorry. The input is a big encoded message, okay? And I don't really want to know the whole message. I just want to know the ith location of the message. Can I figure out the ith location of the message without decoding the whole big thing? And the answer is yes, I can do that much faster than decoding the whole thing. Local decompression. If I have like a whole genome bank and I've compressed it and I'm really using the fact that most people's genomes have a lot of similarities. But now I just want to do some kind of binary search on one person's genome to find something. And do I have to decompress the whole gene bank? No, I can do local decompression. 
Okay, so there are these notions out there. Uh, local generation of random objects. This is one that's taking off recently. Um, but what I'm going to talk about now is really things such as estimating graph parameters. So people have looked at, uh, so I, I actually want to say this is a place where computer science, <coughs> electrical engineering slash information theory, physics, uh, mathematics have converged on something called local algorithms. And it's really, there's some piece of the output I want to compute. Um, it's interesting to us. How do we do it? And all of these communities have been looking at similar problems. And because of this, I will put in a plug. Uh, there is a sequence of workshops called WOLA, Workshop on Local Algorithms. There was one held last fall at MIT and MSR New England. Uh, and there's going to be one held this summer in June um, at MIT. Um, and they were trying to get all these people to talk to each other uh, because everybody's looking at similar problems. Everybody has their own bag of tricks. And we're trying, and it's, you know, so we're starting the process of trying to understand everybody's um, a vocabulary at first and, um, and how they do things. But uh, uh, so there's this whole area. I'm going to just give you one candidate unifying model. There's this large input x. There's this large input that's written down. Let's assume we have random access to it. Uh, last time I gave that the talk in this room, I was told that's not a reasonable assumption. But anyway, let's assume it for now. We have random access to these guys. Um, we, uh, then there's some output that is not written down. Nobody even knows what it is because nobody's computed it. Okay. Now, what I want to do is design this algorithm. We're going to call it the local computation algorithm. And what this does is it gets queries. Like some user says, I'm interested in location I1. I'm interested in location I2. And you send it to this local computation algorithm. And he says, oh, OK, I'm going to figure out. I'm going to make some queries to input x and figure out here's y sub i1. That's, what, that's the value at y sub i1. Here's the value at y sub i2. And every time I ask it about a new location, maybe I'm doing binary search based on what I see, he'll give it to me. OK? Um, just to make things more <coughs> concrete when I talk, I'm going to say that the queries that the LCA makes to the inputs, every time it looks at the input, we'll call that a probe. And every time I make a query to the user makes a query to the LCA and asks about a different location of y, we're going to call that a query. OK, so let's think about maximal independent set. This is not actually an optimization problem because I may want to know the size of some maximal independent set. Or I just want it, in particular, what I'm interested in is, am I in the maximal independent set in this case? OK, so a query to the output is, is node u in the maximal independent set? So what do you mean by the? Great. Hold that. Hold that question. <laughs> uh, OK, don't hold the question. Somebody is a, a kid. Let's hold it for a second. <laughs> hold it just for a second. OK, this is a very good question. OK. Here's a maximal independent set question, uh, algorithm, that I could run. I could run something that I'm going to just for today call the lazy, greedy algorithm. OK? So, Initially, the local computation algorithm assumes that this maximal independent set is completely empty. And when it gets a query that asks, is node u in the maximal independent set? Then it kind of checks and sees, did I put the neighbors in the maximal independent set yet? And if not, it says, yes, <coughs> sure, put them in. I know if one of the neighbors are in the maximal independent set, then I can't put them in. Actually, are we all clear on what maximal independent set is? That, uh, does anybody want me to define maximal independent set? Just remember, OK, I'm going to define maximal independent set. So in a graph, a maximal independent set is a subset <coughs> of, the, of, the, um, of the vertices. So let's call this thing um, i. It's a subset of the vertices um, such that no two are connected by an edge. That's an independent set. The largest maximum independent set is NP complete thanks to Dick in his initial paper. So that's like one of the first NP complete problems. But we don't want the biggest, max, the biggest independent set. What I want is something that I can't kind of greedily increase. OK, so if I take this is, OK, so this is an example that is not a maximal independent set because, uh, ah, look, that's cool. OK, it's not maximal because what? How do I make it bigger? I can just take this guy and add him in, OK? 
Now it's a maximal independent set. I can't add this guy in because he's neighboring somebody that's in the set. I can't add this guy in and I can't add that guy in. So this is a maximal independent set. There's nobody I can add. In just every node that is not in the maximal independent set is adjacent to somebody that is in the maximal independent set, so I cannot add it in. Okay? So are you still gonna punt on V? What's that? You're still gonna punt on the maximal set? Maximal I'm set. always gonna punt on the maximal independent set. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, yes, I am gonna punt on it. Um I uh, so, okay. I should say I'm I'm doing maximal independent set because because I can. <laughs> Um, for a couple of reasons. When, when is we have results on it and it's easy enough to, that I can hope to try to explain it. Um, but actually, it doesn't necessarily give you a good, well, if I had degree bounded graphs, then I could say something about the relationship of the maximal independent set and the maximum independent set. It might not be good enough for most people's purposes. But <coughs> if I have a bound of degree d, then the maximal independent set is no more than d times, d, factor of d smaller than the maximum <laughs> independent set. I mean, there's always, so that's one thing. Um, but uh, more importantly is this is a really, these can be translated into um, matching, maximal matching uh, problems. And maximal matching um, can be further translated into approximate maximum matching. And maximum matching is in P. That's something we can do in polynomial time. So approximate maximum is something, is kind of the compromise we pay for being in sublinear time. Uh, but we can do something like that, okay? Uh, so, so this is really, you know, in itself maybe not interesting to most people, but I'm still going to talk about it. Okay, so this is, so now one way to do maximal independent set sequentially, forget about a, forget about a, um, the, se the sequential greedy algorithm for maximal independent set is look at the nodes in some order, um, and if, so as I go down the order, I look at the first node. Are any of its neighbors put in the maximal independent set? No, because this is the first node. So put it in the maximal independent set. I look at the next node. Have any of its neighbors been put in the maximal independent set? Depends. If it was connected to the first node, then I can't put it in the maximal independent set. But if it wasn't connected to the first node, I can put it in. And I just go down the line, always checking, have my neighbors been previously put into the maximal independent set or not? What this is saying to do is use the queries of the user as your arbitrary order of doing this greedy maximal independent set order. Okay, so it's a strange thing to do, um, and I don't like it. Okay, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. But one thing is, if you did this, you'd have to um, you'd have to remember all your past decisions. Okay, so you'd have to keep space that contains all of your past decisions and write that down. And but on another hand, it's extremely good because my probe complexity, I just have to look at what I did with my D neighbors. This, I'm assuming this is a degree bounded graph. I just have to look at my D neighbors. My probe complexity is order D. What I do with it is very simple. So it's nice. But I have to remember my past choices. And furthermore, some people ask the question, what do you mean by the maximal independent set? There may be many maximal independent sets. And in particular, my, the maximal independent I choose this way is going to depend on the query order, which is sort of a weird thing to do. Because let's say there's, we're computing in the cloud, OK? And these LCAs are like running off in the cloud, and there's multiple copies of them working together, OK? And I'm trying to figure out if somebody's in the maximal independent set. And Manuel over there is trying to figure out if somebody else is in the maximal independent set. And maybe we do this at the same time and we didn't communicate with each other. We may make inconsistent decisions. OK, so there's a consistency problem that comes from the fact that there are multiple answers. And when we choose the answer, we have to be choosing in the same way. So I don't like using query order, because if I wanted to run multiple copies of these local computation algorithms, they'd have to talk to each other and say, OK, I got this query. You better keep that in mind when you pick the next maximal independent set. OK, so they'd have to be talking to each other continuously. All right, so we'd like to avoid these problems. And this is the big problem. It's consistency. OK, so let's talk about this model one more time. We've got this input. Um, the LCA gets a random string um, and some workspace. Not too much of either. Um, and then there are multiple maximal independent sets that I could have picked. It's not necessarily polynomial. It could be much bigger. 
Uh, and I flip that random string, and that somehow selects one of these maximal independent sets. I might not know, I mean, I flip the random string, I, I don't know what yk looks like just because I flipped the random string, but that's going to fix a specific maximal independent set. And now I'm going to assume that everybody that's operating out there in the cloud, all the little copies of this local computation algorithm that are running out there in the cloud, have the same random string, so we communicate initially, then we go to work. Okay? And let me tell you that I actually use this algorithm. Because, yeah. How big is the random string? Okay, let's I'll get to that in a minute too. But I want to tell you how I use it with constant size random string, okay? I gave, an, I gave a data structure and algorithms exam to a class of 300 people, okay? We don't want them to sit next to each other, right? So we need a maximal independent set. You shouldn't have two people, and we want it to be big. So we, and we had a course staff of 15. We had to agree in advance. So we were like all the same LCAs computing in the cloud. We couldn't talk to all 15 of us and have a every time a new student walked in, there's 300 of them, and they walk in all at the same time. So we had to have, each person had to have an algorithm in their head of how to get a maximal independent set out of this. And we had to be consistent. So we actually fixed the maximal independent set in advance. But <laughs> so we really cheated, but we didn't really flip a random string. We computed it gave a concise representation and said, everybody follow this one. But you could do this. OK, now, um, so, so the idea is here, there's some random string. It gets flipped once. Everybody gets the same random string. And uh, you have to answer, everybody has to answer according to this same um, answer. OK. We want that the time to answer, to, the time to answer a query, the random string, the workspace, we want all these things to be sublinear if possible. Okay, so this was the picture explaining how this is me and the TAs and the other faculty teaching this course, and we were all initially sharing a random string, but after that we answered all queries independently. Okay, so how do we design these good LCAs? What we want to do is find a maximal independent set algorithm with a nice property that any node v has an output that depends only on a few of the inputs. Okay, so some kind of um, local area Somehow, if we can find this, then we could just figure out what A would have done for V. So if like the answer here only depended on a few other inputs, then I can just figure it out myself, what would have happened. I can just query the, look, the inputs here and compute it by myself. I don't need to query everything. But where do you get, I mean, this is like miracle algorithms, right? That's, I've never heard of such a thing. I thought I never heard of such a thing. But then, it turns out, there's this whole area of distributed computation called Local distributed algorithms. Okay, and what that means, okay. what that means is these are distributed algorithms where we work on a network and we try to compute some property of the same network, the one that we're communicating on, that's the same network where we want to compute an independent set. So the input is the same as the communication network. That's like, that seemed really weird to me. I always thought distributed algorithms have a communication network, and then they take as input some arbitrary graph and they compute that. No. In this model, in local distributed algorithms model, the communication network is the input. Okay? So it's just one graph, the input and the communication network. Now, um, what do they get to do in a round? In a round, everybody gets to talk to their neighbors. So I get to look, talk to all my neighbors, and I get to send each one their own message, and they can all, and I get to receive a message from each one of my neighbors. Okay, um, and so if I have a k round distributed algorithm for some problem, then what can it depend on? Well, let's think. In one round, what can I, what can my, if if I have a one round algorithm for something, what can it depend on? My my answer has to depend only on my neighbors, because that's all I can hear from in one round. Okay, in two rounds, okay, in two rounds, I can get messages from my neighbors in the first round. They can get messages from their neighbors in the first round, and in the second round, they can pass on to me information that was computed from their neighbors and whatever they initially had. Okay, but that means that if I just went and figured out what the neighbors' inputs were, um, I figure out my neighbor's inputs and my neighbor's neighbor's inputs, okay? So I look at the two ball around me, the radius two ball around me, and I look at every single one of those inputs. Um, I can compute myself what this distributed algorithm would have done, okay? So in general, for k rounds, 
the only information I can get is from things K away. When the, you know, I, so the, and the things K away, they, you know, okay, so just following this uh, argument, I can hear from the K radius ball around me, and I can read it myself in the degree of the graph raised to the K probes. That's how big this ball is. Okay, so I can read and simulate the whole distributed computation by myself without the help of my neighbors. Just by going there, because I have random access, I can go read their values and figure it out all by myself in D to the K probes. And you would say, OK, that's exponential. And Eddie just told us we don't like exponential um, running times, right? D to the K sounds really bad. Except we're assuming, again, for this part of the talk, I'm assuming that the degree is constant. For now, let's give me that. Um, and it turns out that in distributed algorithms, they have been coming up with algorithms where k does not depend on the size of the input graph. So these, this k is, might depend on 1 over epsilon, but it does not depend on the size of the input graph. OK, so it's amazing work in distributed local algorithms. Um, and I'll say a bit more about it on the next slide. But for them, local is constantly many rounds. So k is constant, and that is polynomial in D, but remember the D we're thinking of is also being constant, so it's like constant to the constant. Or, or let's just say maybe constant is too touchy of a word if you care about epsilon, which most people do. So let me just say independent of n and independent of n. Okay? So let's leave it at that. Okay, so, so that's the beauty, that we can make use of fantastic pro progress in local distributed algorithms. And, you know, so there's these nice say, algorithms that, um, you know, I can try to convince you that there shouldn't be a fast distributed algorithm for um, maximal independent set, but it actually turns out there's a really good one due to Luby. Um, and that doesn't right away give you the best local computation algorithm, but with additional ideas that build on this algorithm and use different algorithms and do some other rounds of things, you can put together and you can get a whole series of works, and these are people from both the distributed local algorithms community as well as the local computation community. And basically right now, um, you know, these people are all working together, so it's hard to kind of imagine who's where. But um, uh, so, so not only did the ideas from distributed algorithms help with um, building local computation algorithms, but actually some of the ideas from local computation algorithms um, in turn just improved some of the distributed algorithms. So these kind of two communities have started talking to each other in the last few years. OK, I think I don't have much time to talk about. There are other basic ideas that you can use uh, to, um, to build local computation algorithms, but I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to just skip this part because I want to uh, mention why I got to this local computation algorithms. One is I wanted to tell you about it. And two is um, it is sublinear time. And the other thing is I wanted to mention that uh, there's a connection between local computation algorithms and what we talked about before of parameter estimation that's really simple. Okay, it's like really, I just want to point out that local computation algorithms are a stronger thing than parameter estimation. And there's a really simple way to see this. So I'm just going to take an example. I'm not using maximal independent set here because, um, because nobody estimates the size of a maximal independent set. Let me switch to <coughs> approximate matching, approximate maximum matching. Okay, if I had a local computation algorithm that told me for each edge whether it's in the approximate maximum matching. I mean, this, this local computation algorithm has to fix on a single one that's good. Um, but it tells me for each edge whether it's in the one that this local computation algorithm is thinking about after it tossed its random string. Um, then what I would do to estimate the size of this matching is I just sample several edges uniformly and ask the LCA on each one of those edges whether it's in this particular matching M. And then I'd output the fraction of edges in M that the LCA said was an M times the total number of edges. And that would give me an approximation to the size of that particular approximate maximum matching. But if I had a guarantee that the LCA approximate matching was big, then this would give me a good estimate of my approximate maximum matching. OK? All right, so this is just a simple thing you can do for any problem. So you can use things like you can do vertex cover, approximate vertex cover. So, so remember that vertex cover is MP complete, but approximating vertex cover to within a factor of two is something we can do quickly. Um, and there are our sublinear time algorithms for approximating vertex cover. Um, so a, that's another example of something you could do with this. So it's a general paradigm that when you build an LCA, you can get a sublinear time approximation. 
Okay, what I want to talk about in my remaining very few minutes uh, is, okay, is what happens when the data actually isn't written down? So I'm completely changing now, okay? Part two, it's only 15 minutes. But I'm completely changing topics because now there's no data written down at all. What's the data now? It's just samples of some distribution. And let me take an example, like the lottery, okay? Um, you know, there was the New Jersey pick three and pick four. You pick three digits, uh, one, zero to nine, zero to nine, zero to nine, that's pick three. And you pick four digits, you know, you do it four times, that's pick four. So in the pick three, there is, uh, yeah, ten, a thousand, right? <laughs> a thousand. I, the simple calculations are the hardest, but <laughs> um, a thousand possibilities. So you have a domain of size a thousand. In pick four, you have a d domain of size 10,000, okay? How do you know if this lottery is uniform? Like, let's say I even believe you that every time you pick, it's independent. Okay, let's say I give you that, but I don't know if your distribution is even uniform. How would I test that? It's a very large domain size, and I need 10,000 different draws to, to even see each, to even hope to see each element once, but we know even that isn't gonna be enough to see each element once because of coupon collector. So, how am I gonna do this? Because the pick, those lotteries haven't been even running long enough for me to see enough draws. To, they it take, you know, if you do, it takes decades for them to get to enough draws that you can actually say something about them. All right, so this is the issue. Um, and there's even a true story here. Uh, there's this <coughs> Polish lottery, Multilotek, which is, um, it's actually a physical machine with 80 balls. Every day they choose 20 of the balls. Um, and that's how the lottery is run. But the initial machine they used was biased. The probability of balls 50 to 59 somehow, because of physical properties, were too small. Okay? But this is a case where n is not that big, it's 80. And furthermore, you're taking 20 balls each day. So you're taking a quarter of the balls each day. Okay? So you're getting pretty good estimates of these balls. And here, thanks to Eric Price, uh, this is the uh, picture of the statistics that we get for each of the balls. And you can see here that 50 to 60 had much lower probability and people were making lots of money off of this, okay? Because it didn't take long for them to realize that there was a problem with the machine because the domain size was small and they were getting lots of samples, okay? Uh, so that's what happened there. But what do you do with New Jersey pick three, pick four? I mean, the number, you will get one draw a day and their N isn't 80, it's 10,000. So, you know, when we did this test, when we looked at this, um, I mean, it was a long time ago, but when we did this test, um, it hadn't, you didn't have as many samples as the size of the domain. And so if you just stuck the numbers of past lottery hits into chi-squared test in, in Excel, it said no confidence. That's, that's the answer we got, okay? So maybe you want to know something else about this. I'll talk about testing whether a lottery is a uniform, but maybe you want to know whether the distribution has a specific entropy, you want to estimate the entropy, or you want to count the number of distinct elements, you want to know something about is it a monotone distribution, or is it like, does it go up and down, is it k-modal, um, does it look like a Gaussian, um, or you know, some other property? Well, what do they do in statistics? They've looked at this before. Um, normally, they assume something about it, like maybe that it's sort of a slightly smooth Lipschitz type function, or maybe they assume that um, it was a normal distribution, but they just don't know the parameters of the normal distribution. So there's some type of assumptions, and um, actually very little of the work um, done before ever actually assumed that the domain size was extremely large, it was discrete, and we know nothing about it. Like we know no assumptions, no Lipschitz conditions, no, uh, no, no nothing, okay? So these are problems that have been considered in many places, but Looking at the not sample complexity in terms of the domain size was a question that we want to answer. And the question that really I want to rephrase the question is, in order to answer those questions, do you need to estimate the probabilities of each domain item or can you do something in, you guessed it, sublinear time in the size of the domain? Okay, so I want to take sublinear samples in the size of the domain. All right, and the question is, is this even possible? All right, so let's just tell you the model. I'm just gonna assume the distribution is given to me as a black box. I push a button, I get a sample. And all I'm gonna worry about paying for is sample complexity. I will not, in this talk, 
worry about running time, although the running times are reasonable. Okay, so I get this black box. I'm gonna assume that the domain of the distribution is size n. So I have n elements in the domain, it's discrete. P sub i is the probability that this, this, this black box outputs um, item i. And what I'm interested in is the sample complexity of whatever problem it is I'm trying to solve in terms of n. Okay, so let's look at a first set of properties. Are two distributions similar? Okay, so there's a lot of questions here. If I have two distributions, p and q, I want to know, are they the same or are they far? Well, what do I mean by that? Maybe q is known to the tester, and then this is the question that's known in statistics as goodness of fit. I may ask, is p the uniform distribution? I may, maybe q is the uniform distribution. I'm asking, is p the uniform distribution? Or maybe um, q is some specific Gaussian with a specific parameter, and I ask, is p equal to that? same distribution, okay? Or it could be that Q is not known to me, it's actually given via samples. So I'm getting samples of two distributions, maybe July sales and August sales, and I wanna know are July sales and August sales behaving the same, or are they actually different enough that I need a new advertising campaign? Uh, okay, so let's focus on the first problem. Um, is P uniform? The sample complexity of distinguishing the case where P is uniform from the case where P is epsilon far in L1 distance, um, uh, that's just a, let me just write that. Do I have a, maybe I can write it here. So the, that's the L1 distance. It's um, just the sum over all i in 1 through n of the absolute value of pi minus qi. So I'm taking all the differences for each element and I'm summing up their absolute values. Okay, and it, maybe you heard about total variation distance. Um, so the total variation distance and the L1 distance are intimately connected to each other. One of them is, is a factor of two of the other. I mean, I, one of them is twice as much as the other and I never remember. I think it's the L1 distance is twice as big as the total variation distance. Uh, okay, so, um, all right, so I want to I show that this can be done much faster than it takes me to actually learn the distribution. To learn the distribution, I need at least linear and n many samples. But actually, we can tell if p is u, we can distinguish that case from the ca case where p is far from uniform in root n samples. Okay? And an idea, based, um, this is an idea of Goldreich and Ron, is Actually, let's forget about the L1 distance for a minute. Let's look at the L2 distance squared, which is some pi minus qi quantity squared. So I'm summing this over every i. And let's just look at this for the case where q is uniform, because this is what we care about right now. Um, so q sub i is always 1 over n. Uh, and then this is just, I'm going to, so just humor me. I'm doing like seventh grade algebra right now, OK? What's pi minus 1 over n squared? It's pi squared minus 2 pi over n plus 1 over n squared, right? OK, so now let's just distribute these out into their sum. Notice now that sum pi is equal to 1. And sum of 1 over n squared, I'm summing it n times. That gives me exactly 1 over n. OK, so that means I, it's very simple to see that this is what I get. All right, so I have this L2 squared distance from uniform. And now I've written it as the collision probability of p, that's exactly the probability that I take two samples from p and I get the same thing both times, okay? So it's, I either get, bo either both samples are domain element one or both uh, samples are domain element two or both samples are domain element three and so on, okay? So it's, I get the same thing twice. That's the collision probability. It's exactly some pi squared. So this is a known this is a known thing that people like to work with. Um, minus, um, so this was minus 2 over n plus 1 over n, so it's minus 1 over n. I'm going to assume I know the domain size, so I know this, OK? So I can estimate the collision probability to get an estimate of the L2 norm squared, because I know this. All right, and furthermore, this quantity is minimized for the uniform distribution. This is exactly 1 over n for the uniform distribution. For any other distribution, it's bigger. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to estimate the, the collision probability. That's going to give us an estimate on the L2 norm squared. And then what do I do? 
Well, we know some kind of weak relationships between the L2 norm and the L1 norm, so we'll try to use them. Okay. So, so basically, there's some history here, but the end of the story is okay. So, so the end of the story is um, when you do that, um, you lose something, but in the end, you get um, you get a root n over epsilon squared bound, and it turns out that originally with this method, we didn't get the best dependence on root n over epsilon squared. Um, so it turns out there's like three ways, three or four different ways to estimate closeness to uniformity. Um, there you can actually also count number of distinct elements, or you can use a chi-squared like type of estimator. But um, they all work, and they're all pretty much optimal for most cases, except, um, except this particular bound of looking at number of distinct elements for various stupid reasons. So I'm going to just ignore that. But I, I want to mention, what I want to mention is actually, a, I mentioned before uh, that I'm only going to worry about getting constant probability of error. And then we're going to just use that obvious thing of repeating log 1 over beta times um, to get at most beta error. Remember, we said that, you know, we'll, we'll just. We said that, and I said that for the rest of this talk, that's what I'm going to do, except for one line. Well, here's the line. So Diakonikolas, Guliakis, Peebles, and Price showed uh, recently that you can actually get very non-trivial p values for this problem. In other words, you can get the error, um, the, dependent, the dependence of the sample complexity on your error bounds can be additive as, as opposed to multiplicative. Uh, and th that's a really cool result. But I will leave it to Eric to tell you about it since he's here. So you can ask him in the break. OK. I, um, so I just want to say that um, what about the problem of testing whether p is any other known distribution? So you write down a distribution for me. You write down, tell me p1 through pn. I mean, tell me q1 through qn. Write it down for me. Don't charge me for looking at what you wrote down. But um, now just charge me for samples I need to take from p to see if it's equal to that thing you wrote down. I'm going to still need square root n over epsilon squared. So obviously, I need, I need at least that much, because if you wrote down the uniform distribution, I would need at least that much. But I also need at most that much. So this is no harder. Testing, what we call testing identity is no harder than testing uniformity. So in some sense, actually, it's been shown that uniformity testing is complete for uh, this type of, uniform, of uh, identity testing problem. OK, what I wanted to mention is when p and q are both given by samples, and I get charged for both sets of samples, then things are actually harder. Um, so we thought it should be also a root n, because everything else was root n. But it turned out that it's n to the 2 thirds. OK, so that was a shock to us. Um, why is it so different? Well, I think if there's anything you remember from this section of the talk is anything we do with testing distributions, really, it, if you're talking about sublinear time, and you're talking about symmetric properties, uh, such as uniformity or estimating entropy, in the end, it all comes down to testing collisions. You look at the collision statistics. How many elements occurred one time? How many elements didn't occur at all? How many elements occurred three times? How many elements occurred three times from p and four times from q? That's the only thing that your algorithm can depend on. And you can make this formal. I'm not going to do it right now. But you can actually formally prove such a statement that it's only the collision statistics that matter. OK, so that's the first thing. Um, in the particular case of two unknown distributions, what you can do is come up with distributions that are either, I mean, you can sort of divide the domain in a random way into heavy elements and light elements, and make p and q agree on the heavy elements. OK, so the heavy elements will have identical collision statistics. Uh, and the light elements are either the same for p and q, so in that case, p equals q. Or they're very different from p and q. In that case, p and q are very far. But what's going on in the light, so there's enough light elements that, that p is either identical to q or far from q. But on the other hand, the collision statistics of the heavy elements kind of swamps what's happening on the light elements. And you can't tell what's happening from the light elements, because it's just completely swamped out by the variance of the heavy elements. And that's how these lower bounds go, and that's why it's difficult. But you can do it in n to the 2 thirds time by looking at these collision statistics. So I'm just going to drop this. Um, I do want to say that what I've been talking to about until now is how to tell where, where p equals q or p is epsilon far from q. And depending on your model of q, uh, it's either n to the 1 half sample complexity or n to the 2 thirds sample complexity, both very sublinear. 
But if what you want to distinguish is whether they're close or far, like I have June and July sales, I know they're not identical. I just want to know are they close or are they far enough that I should have a new advertising campaign? Okay, so I know they're not identical. I don't want to just fail them because they're, they're not identical. I, I want to distinguish close from far. That becomes harder, okay? So that requires, still sublinear though, I just want to point that out. It's still sublinear samples, but it's N over log N. Okay, and it's some really beautiful results by Paul Valiant and Greg and Paul Valiant. Um, and the best parameters in terms of epsilon have been <laughs> like attacked by the information theory uh, people. Uh, and they just, they got them. And also beautiful uh, techniques have been added by these people like Wu and Yang have added some really gorgeous techniques to the area and very nice proofs. Um, so this has been a great success. Um, is, is the constant behind the data is reasonable, not uh, much larger than log n? I mean, 1 to 10 or million? <laughs> okay, uh, in the proofs or the actual fact? So in the proofs, I don't know. In the actual fact, I also don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm yeah, no okay, well, here's what I'm guessing. Here's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing that in the proofs, it's probably terrible. Um, just a guess. It's yeah, just yeah. because that yes. always happens, okay? Uh, but what happens in reality, I don't know, and that's the problem. How do you? How would you even test this? Are you going to like run it on every single distribution? I don't know. Um, a, it's a good question. Uh, it's to be the t good open question, okay? Whether it <laughs> yeah, especially because yeah. of the log game, right? With square then is less uh, critical. Right? No, the that's a really good point. It's, I will say though that um, I remember the information theory community getting really excited about estimating entropy, which is something else that's going to be n over log n, um, in order n time. They didn't even have the log n, and the, even that was really exciting. So not needing n log n was already pretty cool. So uh, OK. So I'm going to skip this, because I'm totally out of time. Uh, so I just want to say you can also estimate independence, <coughs> entropy, support size. Similar things happen. Um, you can estimate entropy in sublinear time. Um, maybe just, I'll give one example. You can get a two approximation, a two multiplicative approximation of entropy in n to the one fourth time. In general, uh, uh, gamma multiplicative approximation in n to the one over gamma squared time um, samples. Um, but additive approximations of entropy or support size need n over log n samples, but also can be done in n over log n samples. So this is a really exciting result as well. Um, so lots of other properties have been considered. Uh, and more and more and more and more and more. And uh, let's, I guess I was pretty optimistic this morning. Uh, <laughs> this is a course. Okay. This is a okay, so I just, I'm going to finish. <laughs> so our dependence on n, usually sublinear, um, but it's usually some n to the alpha for some alpha between 0 and 1. So it's like n to the 2 thirds, n to the 1 half. You know, if you're trying to test your pseudorandom number generator, that's not good enough. <laughs> Like those cryptographers, they're always, you know, you know, they're always looking for things that are polynomial in the size of the representation of an element of the set. You know, we're not, we showed you can't do that. You can't test if a pseudorandom number generator is giving you uniform distribution. All right? So is this good or bad? I mean, the cryptographers would say, terrible. And the rest of us are like, well, that's the best you can do, you know, live with it. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's non trivial, but it's still daunting. Okay? So the question is, can you do better? And okay. So how would you get past the lower bounds? You know, and there's been a lot of work in this. So you can look at restricted, I mean, people have looked at restricted classes of distributions, trying to assume something less than saying, OK, I don't want to assume that the distribution was a Gaussian or normal. You know, I don't want to assume that much, but maybe I can assume that it's at most, that it's k-modal. You know, maybe it's bimodal, but maybe it looks kind of like this, not nice and bell-shaped. OK? So let's assume less from our, um, or Let's just do the best we can for each distribution. Some distributions are really hard to test, but some distributions are pretty easy. So can we at least get a sample complexity that depends, is competitive with the best thing you can do for that distribution? Um, and people have looked at that as well. An another thing you could do is look at other distance measures, such as um, earth mover distance, or L2 norm, or uh, you know, there's a bunch of, um, so everybody will always ask me about kullback liebler divergence, and that's always a pain because um, it goes to infinite so easily that you can't, you know, technically you can't, but there are versions of it that are sort of Kullback-Lieber prime that you can do um, much faster, okay?
also you could assume more powerful query mo models. Um, you can assume that you get samples not just uniformly from P, but that I can say, I want a uniformly random sample from a specific range. You know, I want like a uniform sample of something that somebody bought in July, or somebody that something that somebody bought in the second week of July. Okay, so I can make so, sort of, and that's not always unreasonable, uh, because such more powerful query models are sometimes given to us by the systems people. So for example, I've been working with um, Aditya, Aditya Paramaswaran, um, who's at the University of Illinois, um, and he wrote a system called Needletail, which allows you essentially to make a type of conditional sample query. And in fact, in that setting, you can do things much faster. Okay, so you can specify a range, I want a random sample in this range, and then they'll give it to you. Okay. Another example uh, that I think you maybe most of you have heard of is there was a time when Google published all of the, and they took a bunch of texts, a lot of texts, they did a lot of work, and they figured out all the n-gram statistics from those texts, right? So that what's n-gram, so what's a bigram statistic? It's the probability that for any two words, what's the probability this word is followed by this word? Okay, so they published it for up to five grams, I think. So essentially you can use that to get a type of conditional, um, a conditional random sample. So, there are, so the, it does give you a more power, they did a lot of work, but I can build on it now that they've done the work and use it to get a more powerful query. His models. I mean, models use all this. Uh, yes. yes, right. And so once I get these more powerful queries, Many of these tasks that I talked about earlier can be done much, 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 much faster. Sometimes with no dependence on n, sometimes with logarithmic dependence on n, but much faster. So it just depends on whether this is a reasonable thing to assume. Okay, so basically in conclusion, I wanna say that uh, distribution testing problems are everywhere. For many problems, we need a lot fewer samples than you might think. Uh, there's a lot of cool ideas and techniques out there. I didn't get a chance to talk about even a small fraction of them, uh, but I just wanna say that um, I think it's a, there's a lot of recent work in this area, so it's, it's been around for 18 years, but that lately it's really taking off and a lot of people are working at it, and it's an, another area kind of at the intersection of statistics, c theoretical computer science, and electrical engineering information theory people. Uh, and everybody's coming together, mathematicians, everybody's coming together and um, sharing a, so I, I even cited, many of those results that I cited are people that are not from the theoretical computer science uh, community, but there are kind of there has now been a lot of interaction, uh, so that's a great thing, and um, I would be exciting to come join us. So, there. time for questions. Yes. So you think there's a, a course on this? This is a course. <coughs> More yeah. than. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a series of lectures on this, or do you have a book, or? On my website. Your website. On my website, I've taught sublinear algorithms several times, mm -hmm. um, and each time it's a bit different. <laughs> so there's different versions of the course, and I have my lecture notes. They're handwritten, usually, uh, and they, I try to have reasonable, re and reasonable enough handwriting that I can read it when I'm up there. But, <laughs> uh, but, that, but there are, courses. Actually, there was a course taught here on property testing. Um, didn't Alessandro Chiesa teach it? Alessandro, um, yeah. Yeah. So I think it was taught here as well. Um, and uh, some people, okay, some people have been writing textbooks. Uh, so one of my former students, Arnab Bhattacharya, is writing a textbook with, uh, um, and also Dana Ron has written some text some monographs on it. Uh, so there's starting to be more and more information out there. Over there. Distribution testing bounds, you said, do they work for randomized algorithms too? The lower bound for a randomized algorithm? Actually, in distribution testing, a randomized algorithm doesn't help you because you could use the distribution to get your random bits. So you could do a von Neumann trick. You could take two samples, and if the first one's bigger than the second, you could call that bit zero. And if the second one's bigger than the first, you could call that that I flipped a one. And you could use the samples from the distribution to generate your random coin tosses, and then essentially your algorithm would just be deterministic. Right, they charge you for the proofs yeah. to get those random bits, and I'm saying, suppose you get randomness for free. Does it help? That's a good question. 
actually. That's a, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, over there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great talk, as usual. Uh, just two questions, uh, two quick questions. On the, about the matching that you mentioned, in robotics and computer vision, we usually need the weighted matching. Is it trivial to generalize the weighted matching? I mean, when you have weight for each edge, or uh, you want to maximize or minimize uh, the sum, or is it an issue? Or you don't know? I don't know. Um, I remember asking this question of my former PhD student, Krzysztof Onak. And he said, yeah, you can do it. But I don't remember where it's, if it's written, where it's written. It might just be in his head, and it's just so obvious that he didn't bother to write it. But I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Check it, but there's a good chance. There's some chance. I would ask Krzysztof Thank you. If I he knows. <laughs> People ask me all the time when I talk about process and sketch, if I can compare to property testing. So you just say that we allow linear time for the construction, and you want sublinear time for the for the construction, but do you have a third rule intuitively when I can do something in sublinear time, when I must do linear time, and when, when, what kind of problem do we have a good chance to solve in sublinear time under what assumptions? Do you so in general, I don't have a firm rule. Not uh, firm, but firm rule. But um, for, for example, for, for graph properties of, I mean, for graph properties, we even have a theorem that exactly characterizes which graph properties are testable in constant time. So that's pretty strong. We also have it for hyperfinite graphs. But not for Euclidean data, for example, so in point in We don't have any, uh, any such, start. yeah, and I don't really have a good feel for that yet, because I only know of a couple of examples. So. That sounds good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for an amazing talk.